I love attending other churches and just sitting in the pew. I love just to receive the worship and it's wonderful. I don't get to a lot. I work on Sundays, right? But when I have an opportunity just to sit in the pew and sing together and pray together, I love it. But here's the thing. Sometimes when I'm just sitting in the pew at another church, I get just a little judgy, you know? I mean, I, I, I do this for a profession, and it's hard when I'm sitting there not to start to dissect the liturgy and see how they're doing what they do. I try to center my mind to get back to just worship, because it's so wonderful just to worship. But I start getting just a tiny bit critical. It's hard. Now, I'm never very critical of the sermon, actually, because I think when a human being is trying to talk about God and the deep things of life, I think that's just so lovely, you know, that a human being is going to try to put words to what really matters to them and to us. So I don't really judge the sermon much. Even if the architecture of the sermon is not sublime or the pacing is halting, I, I just am so, I'm so grateful that there's a person trying to talk about love and hope. But weirdly, I do get judgy about one thing with the pastors. They're stole. I know that's really weird, but I immediately become sort of the fashion police of clerical vestments. And I'm very opinionated about whether I like the stole or not, because a lot of stoles look too hip to me. They're like tie-dye stoles. Or a lot of stoles look a little too suave with paisley designs all the way. Or some stoles are way too regal, gold-trimmed with Versace styling. I start judging the stole. I try to center my mind to get back to worship. It's so weird that I'll focus on the minutia. The, the little things. After the service, I'll go up to the pastor and I'll say, your sermon was magnificent. I'm a little disappointed with that stole, but no, oh, I don't say that. I don't say that. Something about our mind will focus on little things. If I can get back to the heart of it, oh, just being in worship. But when I get a teensy-weensy judgy, it's on the little things. Like when I'm at a church like the announcements. Sometimes in churches, the announcements go on for like 20 minutes, right? And they're announcing everything that you have in the bulletin you can read anyway, and I start getting judgy about that. It's just a small thing, though. Or I get really judgy about what's the pace they say the Lord's Prayer? Because in my mind, there's some perfect pace that you say the Lord's Prayer. Not so slow it's leaden, not so fast that you're um, not being attentive. I've got some, isn't this silly? But the mind will start comparing and get judgy. And if I'm sitting there and all that begins to well up, suddenly I pray, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people. <laughs> these Methodist ministers, these Presbyterian pastors. I'm thankful that my stoles are perfectly tasteful. <laughs> that I radically limit announcements and the Lord's Prayer is perfectly perfectly placed in a meter of pure devotion. Oh God, I thank you. I'm not like these other people. I become the Pharisee in the pew. See, here's the thing about parables Jesus tells. You almost always are swept into it and become the person that's a little sideways. It's an amazing teaching method. I become the Pharisee and I start being judgy about what's holy or what's right. I start comparing myself to others. I thank God I'm not like other people. Jesus' parable here is like the perfect mouse trap. You start to read it and you start to notice how cartoonish the Pharisee is, that he's so judgy and righteous. And you start to lampoon him in your mind, and you say, oh God, I'm thankful I'm not like that Pharisee, and you just became the Pharisee. It's like a perfect mousetrap. 
And Jesus' parables, they're so finely crafted, they also usually pull a reversal, right? So in a story, you would expect the holy, righteous one to have the good prayer and the wicked, despicable tax collector to not, but here suddenly it's this detestable figure that has the holy prayer, authentic faith, oh God, I'm a sinner. His pure contrition and humility, forgive me, I'm a sinner, have mercy on me. There's this super old church joke, really old. It's in the middle of the week at the church and the two pastors are at the front and they fall onto their knees in the sanctuary and they're saying, I'm a sinner, O God, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. Just then the janitor walks into the sanctuary, sees this display of piety, so the janitor falls to his knees knees next to them and says, O God, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And then one of the pastors kind of sneers to the other pastor, look who now thinks he's unworthy too. I mean, we even compare humility. I'm more humble than you. I just wrote a book, Humility and How I Achieved It. (laughs) We compare about everything. Just like the Pharisees comparing himself to others and being judgy, we do it all the time. All day long, we'll be caught in these endless comparisons, looking at other people, seeing how we measure up or they don't measure up, constantly comparing. And if you get trapped in your mind, always looking around, comparing yourself to others, it's miserable. It's miserable. So I would like to just spend a few moments trying to slow down that process in our minds, this comparison mind, just slowing it down a little. Life is so much more joyful if you can slow down the comparisons. Let me begin with the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre, who believed there is a primary rupture that takes place in the human experience. It's when you feel gazed upon, that someone is looking at you and judging you, and you feel shame or guilt, that there's another consciousness. This is a rupture that takes place. You you are aware that another consciousness is viewing you. You feel objectified or shamed or less. He thinks that's the primary rupture. He wrote a play called No Exit trying to display this philosophy in the form of a drama. In this play, three people go to hell, but hell is not some fiery furnace. Hell is not a place with torture chambers. It's just three people in a lovely appointed parlor room, but with no windows, and they have to spend eternity with each other, feeling viewed by each other, objectified. Now, near the end of this play, he writes his most famous line. I'm sure you've heard it. Hell is other people. Now, that sounds, if you take it out of context, like he's a misanthrope and he thinks that he's judging everyone else. No, he's saying hell is other people because you feel gazed upon by others, objectified. See, I think he's right. That, that that first rupture, it creates this comparison cycle because you feel viewed, you start to view others and compare yourselves to others. I want to slow this down. So I think he's right about that, but I want to tell you something. I don't think you're viewed nearly as much as you think you are. This would slow it down a little. We imagine our lives are on complete display to everyone and that everyone is making judgments about what we do and the decisions we make. You imagine that your life is some sort of performance for others and people are watching. I want to tell you, sure, people watch a little bit, but not as much as you think. 
You would not worry so much what people think of you if you knew how rarely they do, actually. I mean, they do a little, they do some, but we imagine that it's so much more than it's true. Really, for the most part, people are really busy with their own lives. We're all sort of self-involved. But out of any proportion, we imagine everyone is judging how Jim is doing in his life and watching the decisions he makes. It's way out of proportion. So it would slow it down, this comparison cycle, just a little. If you don't feel so viewed, you won't start viewing others in constant comparison. So slow it down. Your life's not a performance. There's a phrase that became very popular, you do you. I think that phrase has the most delightful intent. Now it's so cliched and it's so passe. You do you sounds kind of silly, but I love the sentiment. You do you. Don't constantly compare yourselves to others. You do you. I want to slow down this comparison cycle. I wish that I could do it for you through philosophy. I wish I could convince you that it's a category mistake to compare persons. That a person is this infinity of consciousness. A person is their own unique set of memories and experiences and hopes and strivings and will and values a personality. That, that you can't compare persons. It's a category mistake. You could compare oranges. You could compare apples, but a person is their own category. You can't compare them, but we do all the time. I wish it would be philosophy that would convince you and it would slow down your comparison mind, but I don't think that would. We just love to compare ourselves all the time. But it's really miserable. As you go through each day, and you start comparing yourself to others, that means you will oscillate between feeling inferior and superior. This will be the rhythm, the dialectical rhythm of your day, feeling inferior and superior. As you compare yourself to everyone about everything, you know how miserable it is to feel inferior, but let me tell you, my friends, it's also miserable to feel superior. It cuts you off from the type of togetherness that is our joy. It isolates you, so you oscillate between isolation and feeling worthless. Oh, the comparison mind is grinding. Do you know that the Buddhists practice their whole lives to escape the comparing mind? They'll meditate their whole lives to create a different perception. I don't know if Buddhist philosophy will convince you, but, but do you know Buddhists they believe that they're not seeing reality correctly, that, that this Western distinction between subject and object and all of reality are these discrete objects in some relationship to each other. They believe that's samsara, that's an illusion, that nirvana would be this type of perception where all things are more connected. You can't compare things because everything is, oh, the most famous line from Asian religion ever is the line that breaks down all dualism. Do you know the line? Thou art that. Thou art that. When you gaze out upon someone, you actually are, there's a unity. There's a non-dualism. I wish that the non-dualistic philosophy of Buddhism would slow down your comparison mind, but I doubt that it would. They have to meditate their whole lives to create that. What would slow down your comparing mind? I don't know, because in our culture, it's just, we are trained to compare. And there's a clear specific index. No, there is a holy trinity. There is something in life that we virtually worship. It's the holy trinity in our culture. Smart, thin, rich. Oh, yeah. This is the index by which we compare everything in our culture, smart, thin, and rich, is the holy trinity of what life could be about, right? That's the holy perfection. If you're smart, thin, and rich, you've achieved the fullness of being. And then we constantly compare ourselves. So every day your mind is looking around. Smarts are very important in our culture. We live in a knowledge economy. We really value the intellect, right? So you're comparing yourself how do you compare 
your smarts with that person. You're doing it unconsciously almost all day long. And are they smarter than me or am I smarter than them? I thank God for Howard Gardner at Harvard who developed a theory called multiple intelligences. He said that there's no one form of intelligence, so it's utterly ridiculous to try to compare one intelligence to another, but we do it all the time as if we know what intelligence is comprised of. We don't. It's across such a different spectrum. There are so many different ways to be smart, but we, we compare. It's a folly, really. But we do it, and it's not just on smarts, it's on body type too. We forget that persons are invisible. We totally forget this. Persons are invisible. You're a, a, a consciousness and a will and a hope, but we just go for what we can see, and we make judgments based on people's body types. Oh, the folly of this. If we could just slow the comparison mind, but smart, thin, and rich wealth. Oh, we compare where we are around resources and wealth all the time. Now, a Christian church should be laser-focused on trying to make sure every human being has their basic needs met. Every human being deserves that basic standard of living. But beyond that, do you know how little the distinctions really matter? That when a human being has their basic needs met, do you know how much delta you really create if you just earn a little more money? Because it's not much. Really, you're going to live your life about the same way. If your basic needs are met, there's really, you're going to wake up and have to brush your teeth and face the anxieties of the day. Even if you had a little more money, it wouldn't change your life that much. But we compare down to the finest little detail of where are we in wealth. Oh, I wish I could slow this comparison mind down. So really, I only have one tip. This week, I want you to notice when you compare yourselves, yourself to someone else. Just, I want you to notice it. And then I want you to smile. I want you to smile at the folly of it. I want you to at least recognize this is silly what I'm doing. Just smile at the comparison. My stole has little puppy dogs all over it. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> Amen.